Welcome back to 100 Days of Logic with Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with Propositional Logic, looking at the answers to our first set of exercises on the rules of replacement. I didn't say 90 second philosophy there because this isn't going to be a 90 second philosophy video. It's going to be a bit longer because, as with all of our exercise answer videos, I feel it's important to dig deep into these answers so we really understand why they're right and how to do the proofs in logic. Okay? With that out of the way, let's take a look at the questions. So, we we're going to use the rules of inference to prove the following arguments. These were presented at the end of the double negation video. If you want to take a look now, pause the video, write them down, try them on your own. Your goal is to see it from the premises to the conclusion to prove that these are valid arguments using the rules of replacement and the rules of implication that you have learned so far. I'll give you a chance to do that now. If you've either given up or you have your answers and you want to see if they're right, Follow me, and let's get started. So, the first one we have, the two premises are not P implies Q and not R implies S, and premise 2, it's not the case that P and R, and we want to conclude Q or S. Well, personally, whenever I see a premise like premise 2, it's not the case that P and R, or it's not the case that any kind of conjunction, what I want to do with that is use De Morgan's rule, because that's going to kind of distribute that negation out there, and it's going to get rid of those parentheses that aren't going to be useful for us to work with. Let's give it a try. We end up with not P or not R, from premise 2, De Morgan's rule. Now, if we look at it carefully, we should see that premise 1 and premise 3 are a classic example of constructive dilemma. So, we do a constructive dilemma, and we go straight to our conclusion, Q or S. It's a little tricky. If you didn't see the De Morgan's rule in premise 2, you might have tried a bunch of different things. Always try, whenever you have a negation outside a conjunction, try De Morgan's rule. It's not always going to work, but occasionally it will give you what you need. Let's take a look at the next problem. We have, as our premises, it's not the case that P and Q and Q. And we want to conclude not P. Let's see what we can do. So, once again, as I said, whenever you have a negation outside a conjunction, as we do in premise 1, I want to try De Morgan's rule. So, we'll do not P or not Q from premise 1, De Morgan's. Now what we're going to do is we see we have this not Q hanging out over there. And we're pretty close to actually a disjunctive syllogism. So we're going to use a useful strategy that I remember is it's a 3D strategy because we use the three rules of inference that start with a D and have just two letters. We use De Morgan's rule, then we use double negation. From premise two, we get not, not Q. We're going to throw in something that's not in the strategy, commutativity. You don't technically have to do this, but for it to be a very rigorous proof, you want to switch them around to have the Q, the thing that you're going to deny and use in front. It's not really important. If you didn't do it in your proof, don't sweat it. But if you do want to be extremely rigorous, this is going to be what you're going to want to do. So that was an aside. The third D that we're going to use is, of course, disjunctive syllogism, which we've set up with premise 4 and premise 5, having not not Q and not Q or not P. We end up with not P, which is the conclusion we were looking for. Fantastic. Awesome. Next up, we're going to be looking at something a little harder. Our premises are not P or Q implies it's not the case that R and S. Premise 2, R and P imply T. Premise 3, R and not T. We want to conclude it's not the case that S or T. As you can tell by the amount of space between my premises and my conclusion, we have a lot of work to do. I would strongly encourage you to try problems like this on your own first. It may be frustrating, but work through it. Try different rules of inference that you haven't tried before, maybe, or that you're uncomfortable with using. Go back into the videos, take a look at them. Get a better understanding, because me just walking through the problem with you when you've had no chance to try it on your own isn't really going to be a helpful way for you to learn. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get to the answer. So, whenever I see something like premise 3, a conjunction that's just out there, there's no premise, there's no parentheses around it or anything, what I want to do is split it up using simplification. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get R from premise 3 simplification. Then, because I'm being proper and perfect in my logic, I'm going to use commutativity to switch my not T and R around, so then I can use simplification again to get not T. Once again, it seems like a bit of a superfluous step, and you don't really need it unless you're doing like a really strict, rigorous proof, or you have like a professor checking over your work. 
So, we now have R, we have not T. Well, what can we do with those things? I don't know. Let's look at what not T can give us. Whenever I see not something, I'm going to look for that being tacked onto the end of an implication, so I can use modus tollens, or that being put in a disjunction, so I can use disjunctive syllogism. Well, lo and behold, I look at premise 2, and I see it's tacked on the end of that implication, so I can shove that back up premise 2 to get it's not the case that R and P from premise 2, premise 6, modus tollens. Now, once again, as I said in the previous problems, whenever I see a not and a conjunction, what I'm going to want to do is use De Morgan's rule. Premise 8, I'll do it. I get not R or not P. Premise 7, De Morgan's. Ooh, now I can use my fun 3D strategy. I take premise 4 and I'm going to do a double negation on it. Not, not R. Now, I have two of my Ds, all I need is the third one. And I will get not P from premises 8 and premise 9, disjunctive syllogism. De Morgan's double negation, disjunctive syllogism. 3D. It's a useful strategy. So, I have not P. Well, what can I do with that? I look back to premise 1 and I see, well, I have not P or Q at the front of an implication. Well, where can I get Q? Q doesn't show up anywhere else, but it's on the end of a disjunction. Because I have not P, I can use my useful rule called addition to just throw Q on there. Why not? From premise 10, Addition, not P or Q. Then I'm going to use that, of course, to use modus ponens to get not R and S from premise 11, premise 1, modus ponens. Now, once again, as I've said, whenever you have a negation in front of a conjunction, you're going to want to use De Morgan's rule. Give it a try. So, we do that and we end up with not R or not S from premise 12, De Morgan's rule. Looks like we can now use, once again, our 3D strategy. Well, we've already done our double negation, actually, up in premise 9. We have not not R already. We already have done our De Morgan's rule. We have not R or not S. So, we can just use our disjunctive syllogism now. Premise 13 and conclude not S. Well, let's take a step back. We've done a lot of work, but have we really gotten close to our conclusion? Our conclusion is going to be, it's not the case that S or T... Well, we have not T, and we have not S. Let's take them together and see what happens. Not S and not T from 6 and 14 conjunction. What can we do here? Well, we can go backwards with De Morgan's Law and take them out, because remember, it's a rule of replacement, so we can go either way. And I can pull that out to being, it's not the case that S or T, premise 15, De Morgan's Rule, which is my conclusion. If you were able to make through that on your own, fantastic, great job, keep it up, you have a lot of logic in your future, try the next problem, it's even harder. If not, that's okay, remember those strategies we've talked about of using kind of the three Ds, De Morgan's double negation disjunctive syllogism, and just throwing different rules at it. You don't always have to know that you're going to get to the conclusion. I didn't even look at the conclusion until premise 14, but you're always just trying to get new things and discover new simple premises that you can conclude from your original premises. Okay? Finally, let's take a look at the last problem. We have P and Q, or R and S. We also have Q or R implies not S. And we want to conclude Q all the way down there. Let's see what we can do. So, we don't have anything really nice and easy to work with right at the front. We don't have a conjunction we can split up. We don't have a negation in front of a conjunction we can use De Morgan's rule on. You might be a little worried by this and figuring, how can I work with this? I would encourage you, really try this problem on your own. I'll admit, it took me a long time staring at this problem to figure out what that key first step was. Once you figure out the first step, everything else follows very quickly and very easily from it. So, what we're going to do is we're going to actually use a rule we haven't used yet. It is distribution. We're going to use it in a weird way. We're going to take P and Q and we're going to treat it as one thing, one variable. We're allowed to distribute it. And we're going to distribute P and Q or R and P and Q or S. It's just normal distribution. It's just our first term looks a little bit bigger. That's premise one distribution. Then premise four, we're going to simplify premise three down to just P and Q, or R, whenever I have a conjunction like that, I like to simplify it. And, though we probably could have done a commutativity to switch those around, we're going to conclude from premise 3, also, P and Q, or S. Next up, we will do a commutativity to move that R to the other side, and then, 
distribute again. We're going to distribute the R between the P and the Q. R or P and R or Q. Once again, we'll simplify. R or Q, that's almost something that could be really useful to us. We'll switch it around with commutativity to get Q or R. Plug that into premise number two to get not S. Ooh, we feel like we're getting somewhere. Where can I use that not S? Once again, I'm looking for a disjunction somewhere or an implication. Look up at premise five and you'll find that very disjunction. We can conclude from five and 10, P and Q disjunctive syllogism. We'll switch them around with commutativity to be rigorous. And finally, conclude Q from premise 12, simplification. Wow. A lot of work and a really tough first step to get to. A lot of times it'll be that first step that'll be really hard and everything else will fall out from that. So, that was the answers to the second set of problems. Check out the next series, which is the last series, the last five, the final five rules of inference here, and a final set of problems. Then we'll be looking at two strategies that are going to be the most useful strategies you can ever learn for solving logic problems. And finally, we're almost done with our first half with propositional logic, and we'll move on to categorical logic. Watch a new video every single day for 100 days here at Carnadies.org. Stay skeptical, everybody.